Well, and welcome to Sophie and Co. I'm Sophie Shevardnadze. Protests over the killing of Michael Brown have been dominating in the United States headlines. But this isn't an isolated incident. Just this month, the police have killed a black boy with a toy gun in Cleveland and another black man in New York was shot for no reason. Is police violence getting out of control and can it be linked to racism in the police? Michelle Gross from the Communities United Against Police Brutality is my guest today. State of emergency slapped onto a small US town as public fury breaks out over the killing of a black teenager and the policeman who shot him walks free. Why does manslaughter committed by the force go unpunished? What causes American officers to be so quick to pull the trigger? And can the anger provoked by the killing of another civilian turn the tide of police brutality? Michel Grass, president of Communities United Against Police Brutality, thank you for joining us today on our program. Now, protests over Ferguson shook over 170 cities across the United States. Apart from Ferguson itself, we've seen protests in LA, New York, in Dallas. You're based in Minneapolis. Have people taken to the streets there? And I know you're also in contact with those who are in Ferguson. What do they want? Correct. Yes, we did have a very large protest. Several thousand people were out. Uh, we had called for an event the day after the grand jury decision, and uh, many thousands of people turned out for the, the action. And um, we were able to give people a lot of information about what is wrong with the grand jury process. We were able to educate a lot of people and actually spur them to you know, take on more actions now because there is much to do. There is much to do that needs to happen. Now, the court's decision not to charge police officer Darren Wilson with the killing of Michael Brown, um, it's outraged half of the country. Is there a reason not to trust the grand jury's judgment? Yes, there's very much a reason not to, to trust this process. You know, in a, um, in a criminal in, or in a, a judicial setting, what happens in a court setting is that you have two sides. You have, you know, a defense attorney, if it's a criminal prosecution, you have a defense attorney and you have a prosecutor. And so, you know, you've got two sides. It's a crucible in which there's an adversarial process and facts come out through that process. In this situation, you had one man playing both roles. And that particular individual, not only was he playing both roles, but he has had a long-standing relationship relationship and reliance on the police in order to do his regular job as a prosecutor. There wasn't any way in the world he was going to truly be able to affect, um, you know, a fair process. And now that this whole thing is over, many of the holes in the process are starting to be seen. You know, what should have happened is this. In most states, and I believe it's true in Missouri as well, um, Prosecutors are not required to, to impanel a grand jury unless they intend to charge the individual with first-degree murder. And there's never a way in the world that a police officer would be charged with first-degree murder for doing their job, you know, because it wasn't premeditated and things like that. So, you know, there wasn't even a reason to call a grand jury. What should have happened is that these various witnesses that he said may or may not be reliable or whatever, um, should have been able to be in front of a jury and a real jury, an actual jury uh, that had been vetted by the community and so forth, um, a real jury could have heard the testimonies and decided for themselves what is credible and what isn't. You know, having a one person stand in for both the prosecution and the defense is not possible. It's not correct. And, and of course, it was designed to elicit the exact outcome. You know, we actually said going into this that this was going to be the outcome, and we weren't actually surprised. We were outraged, but we weren't surprised. Also, there was no proper account of the events of that day heard from Wilson until very recently. Why did it take so long? You know, that's correct. And part of it um, is this. If, if you or I or any average um, community member was involved in a crime or even a witness to a crime, you know, we would be interviewed right away. Our um, positions, our um, understandings, our, um, you know, our accounting of the, of the situation would have been documented quickly. First, there wasn't even a police report for the better part of a month that would put into writing 
Wilson's own positions on things. They didn't even interview him or create a police report until the better part of a month. This gave him a long time to concoct his version of reality. And, um, you know, w when you've got two people and one of them is dead and not available to be a witness any longer, then the, w what the other person says takes on great uh, weight. And so consequently, that needed to be ensconced in writing quickly, quickly. You know, this idea of giving him nearly a month to come up with his story before they put anything into writing is wrong. And so that's right out of the gate. And then even since then, his story has changed multiple times. But also, you know, there was a, a, a foolish story that was going around. But, but also, I couldn't, ahead, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't help but notice what he said when he actually said that. Uh, Wilson said he has a clean conscience that he wouldn't have acted any differently. Why is he acting so self-assured in the face of a such strong reaction? Does he feel the police force has his back no matter what he does? That's exactly what the, the issue is. The police force, the city officials, the county officials, the government has his back no matter what he does. And this is characteristic of policing in this country. You know, we have situations, this was an egregious situation to be sure, and it's in, um, and of course people have reacted strongly to it. But we had a situation in Detroit some years back in which a seven-year-old girl, Ayanna Jones, was shot through the top of her head while she was napping on the sofa in her home after police broke into the wrong apartment uh, in a raid. And, you know, here's this young woman, she's I mean, a girl, a little child, laying on her sofa sleeping and is shot through the top of the head. And they could not even get an indictment in that case. You know, we in Minnesota have documented over 208 cases in which police, in which people died at the hands of police in the state of Minnesota in the last decade or so. We have never seen a single indictment. We have never seen a single prosecution, not even a single charge. Wow. Nothing happens in these cases. You know, it just is the nature of policing in America because they're given a wide berth to control the masses, if you will, by any means necessary. We're going to talk in detail about the power of police and why they have so much power. But before we get there, um, I want to talk about this particular case because this time around, National Guard was deployed around the city ahead of the announcement over Wilson. Police, went on st police was on standby and store owners boarded up windows in preparation for riots. The government imposed a state of emergency. Authorities knew there would be public outrage. Was the reaction bigger than expected? I don't think that um, the reaction was bigger than expected at all. And frankly, like you said, they had prepared for it. So it's very interesting to us that with all of these weeks of preparation and all of this expenditure on military armament and bringing in the National Guard and really essentially turning the city of Ferguson into a war zone, it is amazing to us that essentially police were nowhere near the black side of town. Um, you know, the people we're talking to down there have said that police basically abandoned the black side of town and left it to people who are not protesters, but who, you know, there's always people that do bad things and a uh, criminal element and basically left the, that part of town to the criminal element to do the, um, the looting and things like that. You know, uh, I, I really don't think that those people were involved in protests. In fact, I even think that some of them might have well been encouraged to behave in that way. Um, it, it is, it's quite amazing to us that there could be so much preparation and yet that was the outcome. And so many people are quite suspicious. Like I said, many residents in the area are quite suspicious about the role of police in that whole matter. Right, but it, it did look a little scary. I mean, arrests and tear gas, riot clap police, National Guard wearing masks. But at the same time, um, you know, there's looting, there's arson, and that's aren't exact, that, that isn't exactly peaceful, and that has nothing to do with justice. Was police using too much force still, you think? Well, I do think this. They set people up by saying, we're going to make some space for people to protest peacefully. And when they clamped down on peaceful protest almost immediately, you know, telling people get out of the street and shooting tear gas at people if they didn't move fast enough and all of these kinds of things, they set up a situation in which they encourage rioting to occur. And moreover, again, I don't, I believe that the people that were involved in the looting and the burning were not the protesters, that these were people that the police basically 
sort of gave a free for all to and to make the protests look bad. I truly do not believe that they are connected and I and I believe that from the my conversations with people on the ground in Ferguson. Um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty convinced that this was something where they literally, police just pulled out of a particular area, said, you know, let the criminals do what they want to do, and then that will, mu mu you know, muddy things up and make the protests look bad. Mm -hmm. Now, Ferguson is an example of a police department which is predominantly white, and most officers live far from the black communities they serve. How big of a problem is the cultural, cultural and mental gap between the black communities and the white police force? To be sure, that is a huge issue. It happens in just about everywhere. We have it the same way in Minneapolis, um, where largely suburban white police officers are um, essentially an evading army um, in, you know, black neighborhoods or uh, Latino neighborhoods, other communities of color. And um, there's often misunderstandings culturally and things like that. Those things could be taught to people how to interact more respectfully with other cultures. The issue is there isn't a will for it. In this, in this community, I can definitely speak to that. We, we have a lot of officers. You know, we actually have a problem with some of the officers in our police force being members of the KKK, you know, the, the Ku Klux Klan, the a, a white supremacist organization. We have officers who are racially insensitive. We have officers who, you know, carry their prejudices into work with them. And while, um, you know, you can't control what's going on in, in individuals' minds, and any organization it's the job of the head of the organization to control the culture of the organization. And what we have in this town is a failure on the part of leadership to control the culture of the organization. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very much the same thing but, in Ferguson. Uh, you know, the, the, um, when you have a majority black town that's you know, run by, you know, that's um, policed by white officers, these kinds of things are bound to happen. So I'm just thinking, I'm just thinking, wouldn't it make more sense to hire black officers to work with the black community? It would be just easier for them to build trust with the members of this community, which is obviously lacking in Ferguson. You know, this, this is one kind of a solution, but in the end, black officers shoot black people also. Um, it isn't the only solution by a long shot. Much of it, again, has to do with the culture of policing itself and the, the leadership of, poli of you know, police forces that does not control that culture. You know, much of what you have to do, just like any workforce, is you have to set the expectations for your employees, let them know what's um, appropriate and um, what conduct is gonna be accepted okay. by, the, um, you know, by the agency. Clearly these conducts are being accepted, they're not disciplined, and therefore you end up with the same problems. Michelle, problem. we take a short break right now, but when we come back, we'll continue talking about the deteriorating culture of policing in America with Michelle Gross from the Communities United Against Police Brutality Group. Stay tuned. And we're back with Michelle Gross from Communities United Against Police Brutality talking about the protests in Ferguson, the impact of the shooting of Michael Brown and the closing gap between the military and the police in the United States. But talking about the culture of policing, in Darren Wilson's interview on ABC, we kept hearing him say, my training kicked in. How come the training kicks in and 12 shots are being fired? Are police officers just trained to shoot? Shouldn't they be trained to arrest people, not to kill them? Well, that is a huge problem. Shoot to kill is a gigantic issue in this country because, um, you know, we've got now a case that's out of Ohio of a young boy who ha was playing with, a like, a plastic gun. You know, he's a... a you know, 12 year old kid and he's running around in the park. Um, the police roll up on this guy. There's a new video that's much clearer on this little kid and don't even say anything to him and immediately open fire and kill this young man. And so it, the kind of like knee jerk reaction to any situation without a, a, at least a partial investigation, at least a, a, an initial investigation is um, really appalling. And a lot of it, a lot, there's a lot of studies that are starting to come out now that show that because of the individual officer's prejudice, 
you know, yes, we say that officers in this country, you know, there is a permission, uh, a tacit and legal permission for officers if they feel their life is in danger and if there is a legitimate danger to shoot people or to use other kinds of force. But this kind of thing of where you see a black person, even a little kid, and instantly fly into, you know, I've got to kill this kid, it's him or me, you know, there's clearly a problem with that mentality. Um, it, part of the reason that Darren Wilson kept saying that statement about I, my training kicked in, that was legal. That was a legal reason for saying that. When uh, an officer is, you know, potentially going to get charged, they have to rely on their training. By saying, you know, my training kicked in or, you know, I'm doing the training thing, um, what they're saying is if there's any liability here, the city has to pay for yeah, that liability okay. because this is how they trained me. So he's really parroting the lines his lawyer told him to say. Um, police, when they're taught to shoot in order to stop a threat, they're also given power to be the judge and the executioner in any moment they fear for their lives. This kind of authority, I'm just thinking, doesn't this essentially grant them impunity? It does. It absolutely does. You know, and, and the crazy part is that there's never a, like a sort of an examination after the fact to really look at these things and say, was this legitimate? And what, you know, when you say that a person can do what they want to do based on their mindset, how can any of us know what's in the person's mind at the exact moment? So therefore, after the fact, they get to be sort of, um, you know, they get to come up and tell you what was, on, you know, on their minds and things like that. Literally this um, nonsense of I fear for my life. You know, can we have a conversation about what's reasonable? You know, I drive down the street every day and maybe there's other drivers that are poor drivers. I can't act like I fear for my life at all moments because, you know, I'm so precious and, and these other drivers might take me out at any second. You know, we have to have what's reasonable. Is it reasonable for a kid that's playing in the park with a plastic gun, you know, that's clearly a plastic gun, um, for the police to roll up on him within 10 feet of him, jump out of their cars and instantly shoot them, shoot this kid? You know, how can you even say that that's something reasonable? So. A big part of the problem is the reliance on, like, the, so the police officer's mindset. What was he thinking at the time? You know, after the fact, the police officer can say they were thinking anything at the time. So it's a, it's a ludicrous standard. It's, a, it's an incorrect standard. You know, we have to uh, take into account the totality of circumstances. And part of one of the things that the courts have said here that's really problematic is this mindset that, oh, we have to recognize that officers are dealing with split-second situations, blah, blah, blah. I can tell you, as someone who videotapes police on a regular basis and observes interactions between police and the community, that many times police officers escalate a situation that could easily be handled with just words. Mm -hmm. And they escalate it because they want to feel in control at all moments and because they, frankly, some of them want to have the excuse to use violence on people by insulting them, you know, um, agitating people when a simple conversation would do the job. You know, um, I tried to look for a number, a statistics on how many people are shot by police in America. Um, I couldn't find anything, or at least maybe it's just me, but I feel like there is no number. Why is there no hard statistics? on how many people You're are right. killed by police in America. I'm going to tell you that it's not you and it's definitely by design. You cannot get this data no matter how hard you try. The FBI was tasked with actually keeping this data over 20 years ago and they have never ever done it. Our organization gathers this information through contacts with family members, through, um, you know, perusing the media and so forth to try to gather this information. And so we have a fairly good list of people in our own area um, that we maintain on our website. But it is very difficult to get this data because, again, unless you're an organization that's working very hard to track it, there is no central repository for this information. People are trying to put that together, but, I mean, a reliance on the community to do that is kind of ludicrous when the FBI should have been doing this all along. And again, I think it's quite by design. You know, I, I, people are, you know, would really be appalled at the level uh, of, of killings in this country by police. And, you know, the I, and I, I, what I feel is an epidemic of, you know, police brutality and police killings of community members. It's funny you mentioned the FBI because on the other hand, um, I, I did get um, something from the 2012 FBI crime race report. This report shows that the majority of people killed by police are actually white. Is it true to say people of color are more likely to be victims of police violence? 
Our organization, from our historical perspective, and again, we're a local organization based in Minneapolis, St. Paul, Twin Cities. Um, our organization receives, and we have, and we operate a 24-hour hotline to receive police complaints. And um, roughly 60% of the calls we get are from African American folks on our hotline. So our local experience is that. Um, people of color are more likely to be the victims of police brutality. But in terms of police killings, you know, we have not said that that blacks are the majority of killings. In some areas, that's true. In um, in the state of Minnesota, however, whites are the majority of people killed by police, probably because this is, frankly, a very white state. The Twin Cities is a much more um, ethnically diverse area, but the state as a whole is a very white state. So it would make some sense that you would see more white people killed by police in Minnesota. Let's talk a little bit how the police in states is being militari militarized. Um, used military equipment is being given to police departments all over the country. You have big army toys designed for use in actual wars uh, that are given to some departments. Why is this happening? What does the police need this for? They don't need it, and it's uh, it's an expensive boondoggle. It's almost as if, you know, if the feds are going to give it to us, we've just got to take it. And the idea that we have police, to, you know, driving these tanks through the street, um, you know, all of this kind of high-end military weaponry is frightening. You know, we have in this country um, a pos the thing called the Posse Comitatus Act, which basically says that the, U the military of the U.S. cannot be used in the continental United, or the, you know, the United States, within the boundaries of the United States. So what they've done instead is they took the armies, the little armies that exist in every single community, called the police, and they've armed them instead to essentially be an extension of the military. And frankly, they work closely with the military. There are these things called fusion centers where the military, the FBI, federal agencies, Homeland Security, and local police departments share information and strategies and things like that. It is a frightening spectacle. So, um, and the amount of money that is being used for these things is unbelievable. So I'm thinking, Michelle, um, there is some local uh, police chief who's watching the coverage of these riots and sees how, you know, uh, police is being militarized. And he goes, well, I want the same thing. I want a tank, too. Do you think this coverage will actually help the process of militarization? Will there be more support for military equipment in police departments? Because they're scared of the public now, right? You know, it's funny you should ask me that because that's exactly what I said. Yeah, that's exactly what I said. I said, this thing that happened in Ferguson after the grand jury decision was set up to justify the militarization of the police in Ferguson as well as the rest of this country. That's really pretty much the first thing that I said when I um, was talking to people on the ground that said that the police had pulled out of the black area of town that um, and was letting all these businesses burn, you know, and kind of encouraging lawlessness. Um, in my mind, the, you know, honestly, I really do think that's what it is, is this was a way to justify the ongoing militarization of policing in this country. Another interesting fact is that U.S. police force is being trained abroad in Israel, to be precise, and on the pretext of counterterrorism right. training. But Israeli police have vastly different challenges. They're constantly faced with terror threats. There's a looming war so close to their homes. American cops aren't faced with all of that. Why do officials think it's going to work well in America? You know, there. That is a very deep topic. Um, I, you know, I would venture to say in, that the mil that the Israeli military creates a lot of the the situation that they deal with, um, and and to kind of. Um, take our cues or our training from those situations is ludicrous. We don't have that kind of thing going on in the ground here. It shows you the mentality of police in this country that they think that they need to get trained to take on um, people in our communities in the same way that the Israeli army takes on, um, you know, Palestinians in Gaza. It, it's really a, appalling. And um, it's, it's bad training, it's racist training, and it's... Um, unnecessary and inappropriate training, you know, when you are talking about trying to build trust, you know, it's, it's kind of funny. People always want to talk about that building trust and things like that. How do you come from a place like that and build any sort of trust at all? There's no way in the world that 
um, treating people like they're, you know, like everybody's out to get me and everybody's a terrorist and everybody's, you know, I, I've got to look around my back and watch my back. You know, that mentality, again, is um, completely antithetical to any kind of policing that is going to involve building trust in the community, completely antithetical to it. Thank you so much for your interesting perspective, for your insight. We were talking to Michelle Gross from Communities United Against Police Brutality. We were talking about the unfortunate uh, case in Ferguson, the riots that it entailed, and also the culture of policing in America. That's it for this edition of Sophie & Co. I will see you next time. Welcome to Sophie and Co. I'm Sophie Shevardnadze. Protests over the killing of Michael Brown have been dominating in the United States headlines. But this isn't an isolated incident. Just this month, the police have killed a black boy with a toy gun in Cleveland and another black man in New York was shot for no reason. Is police violence getting out of control and can it be linked to racism in the police? Michelle Gross from the Communities United Against Police Brutality is my guest today. In LA, New York, in Dallas, you're based in Minneapolis. Have people taken to the streets there? And I know you're also in contact with those who are in Ferguson. What do they want? Correct. Yes, we did have a very large protest. Several thousand people were out. Uh, we had called for an event the day after the grand jury decision, and uh, many thousands of people turned out for the, the action. And um, we were able to give people a lot of information about what is wrong with the grand jury process. We were able to educate a lot of people and actually spur them to you know, take on more actions now because there is much to do. There is much to do that needs to happen. Now, the court's decision not to charge police officer Darren Wilson with the killing of Michael Brown, um, it's outraged half of the country. Is there a reason not to trust the grand jury's judgment? Yes, there's very much a reason not to, to trust this process. You know, in a, um, in a criminal in, or in a, a judicial setting, what happens in a court setting is that you have two sides. You have, you know, a defense attorney, if it's a criminal prosecution, you have a defense attorney and you have a prosecutor. And so, you know, you've got two sides. It's a crucible in which there's an adversarial process and facts come out through that process. In this situation, you had one man playing both roles. State of emergency slapped onto a small U.S. town as public fury breaks out over the killing of a black teenager and the policeman who shot him walks free. Why does manslaughter committed by the forest go unpunished? What causes American officers to be so quick to pull the trigger? And can the anger provoked by the killing of another civilian turn the tide of police brutality? Michel Gross, President of Communities United Against Police Brutality, thank you for joining us today on our program. Now, protests over Ferguson shook over 170 cities across the United States. Apart from Ferguson itself, we've seen protests. And that particular individual, not only was he playing both roles, but he has had a long-standing relationship and reliance on the police in order to do his regular job as a prosecutor. There wasn't any way in the world he was going to truly be able to affect um, you know, a fair process. And now that this whole thing is over, many of the holes in the process are starting to be seen. You know, what should have happened is this. In most states, and I believe it's true in Missouri as well, uh, prosecutors are not required to, to impanel a grand jury unless they intend to charge the individual with first-degree murder. And there's never a way in the world that a police officer would